So uh, this is the third day of uh, my uh, in the series of my lectures dealing with importance of theory for practice that liberate the mind. Hmm? I have it in front of me, the question. Hmm? So, uh, uh, last time we have talked of uh, the uh, general aspects of the theory. We need a theory that works. That is uh, the correct theory. Some people believe we can investigate the nature of our experience without a theory, but actually uh, the old wise people of the past, like Socrates, said that actually all that we know is what we remember. And uh, what we remember uh, in fact, is uh, mostly what we have learned. What we have not learned, we will uh, not be able to remember. And uh, here comes the importance of theory uh, for practice. When we remember things that they are useful for us, and we can put them into practice, then the liberation is possible. But if we uh, remember the theories which are not used, not useful for liberation, then uh, the liberation is actually uh, not quite possible. Because uh, the memory is what takes us to the secrets of the mind. Through memory, uh, many things can be revealed which are actually hidden in our mind. And uh, memory, according to Buddhism, especially now we're talking about Yogacara, actually uh, directs the way we react to the object. Now, we know that uh, the uh, Buddhism actually talks all the theories in Buddhism are actually concerned with the theory, you may not uh, use it, the word theory here, the fact of dependent origination. Theory is something that you not necessarily can uh, experience but the dependent origination, actually, according to Buddhism, is everything in our experience. Only because we have the limited knowledge. So we see a very, very small fragment of the whole complex of the dependent origination, which is the content of our worldly experience. Even the liberation. The object of liberation does not need any cause. But the way to achieve that object is bound to causes. Same the way the reason for our suffering is also bound to causes. The reason for our liberation, reason for our suffering is bound to causes. Now, how we investigate these causes will decide uh, how we act, actually. So this is why last time I have mentioned that uh, Buddhism actually uh, started as an uh, ism with uh, Abhidharma, which, which puts a system into that what the Buddha has taught. I myself do not believe that Buddha has taught uh, based on the systems. The systems were uh, the product of uh, yogis who have tried to put the teachings of the Buddha 
into practice. And this is their importance. Their importance is because these systems, they were not put together by ordinary persons. They were put together by yogis who were highly qualified. Who have had a long, long history of study, long, long history of uh, wholesome conduct, and long, long history of practice of uh, meditation, of uh, appeasement, and of wisdom. Now, we have explained that these systems then differ. But why do they differ? Because the way we look on the reality, on the causes and conditions, can be in a very different way. So we have explained, if you look at the reality with the eyes of a meditator trained in the uh, Theravada Abhidharma, you will see in fact, according to the Theravada Abhidharma, because you have prepared the mind to see so. Similarly, if according to Sarvastivada, you will see according to Sarvastivada, because you have prepared the mind to see so. If you have prepared according to Yogacara, you will indeed see according to Yogacara, because you have prepared the mind to see so. Now, uh, we have already explained that there are actually two systems of investigating the dependent origination. One is based on the rather dualistic approach of seeing the that which is outside and that which is inside in mutual relation, taking it for granted that that which is outside is in nature uh, the opposite of that which is inside, I mean inside mind. But you can also look on the process of our experience, which is basically the experience of corporality and mentality, in a non-dualistic way. What is looking in a way, on a way of our experience in the world, on the dependent origination, on the the non-dualistic basis? Well, the non-dualism you cannot find outside. For non-dualism, one has to uh, look into the mind. And this is precisely what the uh, uh, Mahayana, or say the Bodhisattva path, because the Bodhisattva path is based on the the uh, perfection of wisdom, pragya paramita, hmm? poje polomi, and poje polomi is uh, the non-dualistic approach to reality. So no matter what, how we explain the bodhisattva path, we will explain it if it is the bodhisattva path on the principle of uh, the uh, poje polomi, on the principle of the uh, Transcendental wisdom. Transcendental wisdom is what makes our approach to understanding our experience in the world, the dependent origination, in a non-dualistic way. It does not mean we have studied Buddhism, we have studied uh, the uh, scriptures. We have this non-dualistic approach. This non-dualistic approach is actually a result of a long, long practice and long, long contemplation 
which together with uh, certain uh, principles of uh, inner discipline, we don't need necessarily outer discipline, but everybody who wants to practice appeasement and wisdom needs uh, inner discipline, needs to understand the importance of uh, putting the mind into order. Only the mind which is in order can see the shortcomings. the shortcomings of uh, the, uh, our understanding. If we don't have an inner discipline, we will not see uh, shortcomings of our understanding, of our experience. This is impossible. So, uh, in Buddhism we explain the uh, base for the practice of appeasement of mind is the uh, uh, inner discipline. Inner discipline means the, the discipline of the faculties. Actually, the discipline of the faculties is the liberation itself. The process of liberation and the process of disciplining the faculties, not by force, but by concentration and wisdom, is the very process of liberation. The Buddha in the Agamas, also in the Mahayana scriptures, actually teaches this very thing. In the Samyutta Nikaya, you have the so-called Samudha Sutta, the Sutra of the Great Ocean, where the Buddha indeed teaches that this I is the Great Ocean. When we can tolerate the waves in the ocean of the eye in form of the colors we can cross this great ocean similarly we have uh, six great oceans six senses hmm? the great ocean of the mind which is a base for the other great oceans no eye can become an ocean without the ocean of the mind no ear can become an ocean without the ocean of the mind. And if we can tolerate in this ocean of the mind, the Buddha says, the waves in the form of the mental object, we can cross this uh, great ocean of the mind. Now, uh, from the Yogacara point of view, crossing, there is only one great ocean. We don't have actually six great oceans. There is only one great ocean and this great ocean is called Alaya. And this Alaya contains all the other oceans and all that these other oceans can be able to see. So this is the uh, non-dualistic way to see the reality through the eyes of one great ocean. In this one great ocean of the Alaya, the actually the duality which we experience is created. And it is also created on the basis of causes and effect. Nothing can be created without causes and effect. So, uh, what is the difference between the uh, bodhisattva approach to the practice and the approach to the practice of the uh, arahats? We should understand. And it is also part, in a way, of the understanding of the uh, uh, Agamas and of the Theravada Tripitaka. 
because it is absolutely necessary not just to understand how an arahat makes a way to freedom from suffering, but how did the Buddha himself make it? Even so, the Buddha is an arahat. Everybody studying Buddhism knows perfectly well, as Shariputra explains, that the Buddha is not an ordinary arahat. He has something more than an ordinary arahat. And that more is precisely explained in the Pragya Paramita scriptures as the non-dualistic wisdom, Nirvikalpagyana. We have explained that according to Yogacara, you cannot realize liberation without understanding the alaya and understanding the nirvikalpagyana, the wisdom free from differentiation. Arahad has made it to going beyond suffering because of the wisdom free from differentiation. The Pratyeka Buddha, the Buddha for himself, made it due to wisdom free from differentiation. And the Buddha, of course, he made it also due to wisdom, free from differentiation. Even so, they made it all, all who have realized the liberation, they realized it because of the wisdom free from differentiation. Yet, uh, the way how they experience this wisdom free from differentiation is different. The way is different because their theory for practice is also different. And the theory of practice is different using the Yogacara understanding is because they put different in ways of uh, uh, informations, different uh, uh, ways of investigating the experience. If you investigate the experience, I have already mentioned that according to Theravada or according to Sarvastivada, you uh, pay attention to one object at a time. You cannot pay attention to several objects at a time. So you can have only one sensation at a time because you pay attention to only one object at a time. But because of the speed of the mind, you are actually not noticing. So you may think that you are experiencing uh, different sensations at the same time. This is because you don't see the impossibility of the mind attending to one object to experience the other object. Now, what will be the situation if you uh, use a theory of the mind attending to several objects at the same time. And what is this, this mind? Of course, this mind is the alaya, the ocean of the mind. So, uh, the experience that we have of ourselves and of the world actually happens in this ocean of the mind. This is the approach of the yoga chara. Now, how we uh, approach this ocean of the mind depends on the way how we observe the mind. This is a uh, very important point that has been very often disregarded, but which is crucial for our understanding of Buddhism. So the way how we observe the mind will actually determine 
the way how we react. How we practice. No matter whether we have a theory for practice or we just observe the mind without any theory, still, how we observe the mind will decide how we act. Now the privilege of the, I have mentioned, of the human beings is that we have, uh, the, we live in the world where neither happiness is predominant nor suffering is predominant and we have, uh, due to our uh, ability for uh, formulating our experience in a uh, developed way of communication, developed language, we have the way of uh, practicing introspection. So, uh, according to the Yoga Chara, uh, our uh, the uh, first cause, Yoga Chara explains our experience on a very developed series of causes. According to Theravada, for example, we have only six causes through which we can explain all the activities of our mind, wholesome or unwholesome. Either we have Grasping, we have resistance, we have ignorance, or we have their opposites. So everything unwholesome is based on these three, and everything uh, wholesome is uh, based on their opposites, on non-grasping, non-resistance, and non-ignorance. When we investigate this as it should be investigated on the base of the uh, Yonisho Manasikara, Ayonisho Manasikara, the attention which is based in reality or attention which is not based in reality, attention that is based in reality sees the impermanence in everything that we experience through attention. There has to be attention, then we can be aware of the impermanence. If we don't have attention, we won't be aware of the impermanence. When we have attention, when we take the sign of the object outside or inside our body, we will experience actually impermanence, provided the mind is concentrated. So, uh, from the point of view of uh, traditional Buddhism, the nature of non-science or ignorance or avidya, which means actually non-science, is not to see that the nature of our experience, and I repeat the experience when we pay attention to the object, especially with the concentrated attention, not with uh, attention just based on uh, our uh, search outside, but on the concentrated attention which turns inside. We will see that the content of our experience is impermanence, inside, outside, hmm? impermanence, the deep meaning of impermanence is the grasping. 
real suffering is grasping for the existence, which is the five aggregates. This is the truth of suffering. And the cause of suffering is precisely this grasping. When there is grasping, there is suffering. When there is uh, suffering, there cannot be self. So, uh, uh, not seeing this is ignorance, strictly speaking. This is inner science. If we want liberation, we need the inner science. Now, uh, as we should know, in the practice of the Bodhisattva, what is, is being non-dualistic, it extends the scope of uh, non-knowing, of ignorance. Not only in order to practice love, compassion, in order to uh, stay in the state of suffering, of impermanence, and not to suffer, and continue to be useful to sentient beings. So the inner science is not enough. Inner science will lead us to turning away from the suffering of impermanence. But turning away from the suffering of impermanence based on the inner science only. Inner science is to realize that actually the cause of our suffering, the cause of our ignorance, is the mental perversion. Hmm? Seeing permanent that which is impermanent. And we see it that which is uh, permanent as impermanent that which is impermanent is permanent because we don't observe the mind. The mind, when it takes an object, it becomes impermanent. When it pays attention to an object, it becomes impermanent. When it differentiates an object, it becomes impermanent. When it holds an object, it becomes impermanent. That is the nature of the mind. And when it holds the object, when it pays attention to the object, it goes to the object. And when it goes to the object, it uh, receives the object in the mind. That is sensation. It uh, perceives the object, takes the sign of the object. When it takes the sign of the object, already in the act of attention, we have our memory. So, the likings and dislike, tendencies to likings and dislikings and so on, will appear. This is a natural process. when it will be uh, unwholesome liking, it will be only liking for satisfying our individual egoistic desires. If it will be wholesome liking, it will be for realizing the Dharma, but we will be programmed by the way we made the sign of the object and how we receive it.
So when there is a men mental process and the very differentiation, we are programmed. We are programmed by our memory. And uh, we, ha we have to explain a memory. If uh, the mind is impermanent, how to explain the fact of memory? We have to explain the continuity. This continuity precisely is the alaya. This continuity precisely is in Theravada, the Bhavanga. So this allows continuity. So no matter how you explain it, Bhavanga, you explain it by the past. Uh, immediately preceding mind, hmm? like in the Sarvastivada, you explain it by alaya. You have to explain the continuity, because unless you have explained the worldly experience, you cannot go to the ultimate reality. Ultimately, the ultimate reality and our worldly experience have to be one. And this is especially important if you adopt a non-dualistic approach to investigating the nature of your experience. So, uh, So no matter how we approach the nature of our experience, we have to explain the continuity. And we have to explain the memory, which basically decides our attitude towards reality. Without a memory, we don't have any attitude towards the reality. So, uh, our past experience must have been stored somewhere. Be it in the uh, immediately preceding mind or in the... Uh, uh, Bhavanga, which means literally the cause of existence, or in the Alaya, which means literally the consciousness which abides, which clings. Li means stick. Alaya is derived from this root, Sanskrit root, Li, sticking. When the mind is sticking, we experience the suffering. We experience impermanence. So uh, the way to get out of this complex is to make the mind non-sticking, -sti non-sticking mind. Sticking mind is differentiation. Non-sticking mind is wisdom. So, in this perspective, we may know many, many things, which is not bad. But as long as the mind is sticking, we will, uh, this knowledge will not be able to deprive of, of the fact of suffering. Only the uh, knowledge free from sticking will be able to deprive us from the uh, very act of suffering due to which we need a theory for practice that liberates the mind. If we don't have this suffering, we don't need any theory. <coughs> so, uh, what the uh, Bodhisattva does in order to 
study the non-dualistic nature of the reality and the dependent origination arising in the actually non-dualistic mind which is the only true nature that there is the only lasting nature so uh, what to do extend the understanding of the dependent origination actually you will find the same tendency in the Theravada the Theravada does the same thing on the base of the so-called niyamas the rules that govern the cause and effect the rule of karma the rule of mind the rule of the uh, seed hmm? Bija, that means a vegetation, you can get only mango from the mango seed. Hmm? And the rules of Dharma, all these, uh, all the things that we experience governed by the rules. Now, uh, the uh, Yogacara adopts a very different approach. If you want to realize the non-dualistic approach, if you want to realize the wisdom which does not differentiate between the content of the worldly experience and the, and the highest reality, because the five aggregates, if you study Buddhism, the five aggregates is all we have. But the five aggregates from the Yogacara point of view is also a concept. If nobody teaches you five aggregates, you can uh, make other five aggregates. Why not aggregate of memory and so on? Of course, the five aggregates is the most intelligent approach. But we need this approach. We use this approach because it was taught by the Buddha. Hmm? And we have uh, three Brahmanas, the three Jen uh, Liang, uh, no, how to say, the three uh, uh, ways of establishing the truth, hmm? either by direct perception or by uh, the uh, Anumana, by in inference or by the scriptures. Hmm? Some, the Buddhist, Buddhist logician, Finally, because important is discussion with the non Buddhist, they don't take this uh, authority of the scriptures as being the objective. Hmm? But anyway, uh, for the theory of practice that leads, that uh, liberates the mind, this uh, theory is objective. Because what the Buddha, according to the Buddhists, what the Buddha has taught is not a theory but the way the things are. So, to understand Buddhism, we believe that no matter whether the Buddha explains or not explains, uh, what the Buddha has taught is the things as they really are. And no one can improve on the fact that we are in a state of uh, birth and death process, which happens not only from life to life, but which actually happens moment by moment, and which also happens with every thought process. Every thought process arises because of attention. And ends and arises again. So we experience actually uh, impermanence in all our activities, worldly activities. And 
in terms of uh, the lifespan, in terms of uh, the mental processes, in terms of the momentary change. Understanding that is actually a, a very deep spiritual understanding, including the whole way of seeing. It, does not, it is not as some misunderstanding, the pessimistic view of the world. It is the fact. And the fact can never be uh, pessimistic. The fact can never be pessimistic. Actually, the fact is uh, the fact. And on the base of the fact, we can construct uh, valid theories. If the theory does not uh, refer to a fact, it will not be a valid theory. And the fact of our worldly experience is impermanence. Now, uh, Finally, what we want to realize if we want to practice a non-dual approach to investigation of our experience, we want to extend the inner, no, the scope of the inner science. And a Buddhism does it by speaking of five kinds of sciences that should be studied by anyone who wishes to accomplish the Bodhisattva path, the path to Buddhahood, the path to omniscience. And that is medicine, because in Buddhism we study Buddhism by studying what is wholesome and what is unwholesome. The best answer to that is actually medicine. So a bodhisattva should study a medicine if he wants to, if he wants to help others. Real medicine is cause and effect. There is a disease, suffering. There is a cause of suffering. There is a. There are symptoms of suffering. These symptoms have to be studied. And these symptoms have to be uh, abandoned or cured by a suitable medicine. This is Buddhism. So we have to extend our knowledge of Buddhism by the knowledge of medicine, knowing what is wholesome, what is healthy, and what is unwholesome, what is unhealthy, to put order into our life, to put inner discipline into our life. The real discipline, inner discipline, is based on precisely on that, on this understanding what is healthy and what is not healthy. But because we are very ignorant, we actually mostly use the theories which are not according to the ways the things are. So we believe we definitely need this medicine, only this medicine is the right one and don't see anything else. So this is also ignorance. So this is how we extend the, our understanding of our worldly experience of dependent origination. Then, of course, also according to Yogacara, the dependent origin, deep understanding of dependent origination on the base of non-duality is understanding of the three realities. Because we don't see these three realities at the same time, we are also ignorant. And what are these three realities? The reality of the self-existent, which simply does not exist, 
the reality of dependent origination which exists but not as we experience it because we have a deep deep tendency to take the things not as a process but as something that is there that something that is there does not exist because what we experience is purely and only a process so what is there is just our mental image not more than that and so the mental process actually and so it is explained in yoga chara starts from understanding that our uh, dependent origination is dependent on the vyavahara on the uh, communication and the communication is dependent on the language and the language brings the idea of something being there something being there which simply stands because we relate to the things by language so we take our feelings to be objective but the feelings are based on or these uh, fe- uh, sensations emotions they are based on the mutual relation how we understand the mutual relation will decide how we actually sense receive the object and this mutual relation will be again uh, based on uh, our idea of something being there something that can be grasped that can be held that can be possessed now to go further we believe that there is something is which is there and that can be possessed and that we can relate to it as being there this is due to the so called vasanas vasana means literally the perfumes in our mind the mind is free from perfume but we have perfumed it by the previous experiences of holding the object resistance to the object and not seeing the object as it really is the practice of the bodhisattva is to rely on the fact on the vastu on the sh not to rely on one sensation but at the same time we should observe and see very clearly how the sensation works because being deluded means being deluded especially about the sensation because we differentiate the object on the base of sensation and the sensation becomes powerful because of our previous experience this is very important to understand 
then we act and we act because the seeds of the vasanas become the seeds which have uh, which have uh, been uh, which have ripened and they ripen because of also of causes and conditions which are clinging then we act because the conditions are there we have the senses we have the object we have the functioning we have the effort so all these conditions are there then we act then we act but our acting is can only be according to the circumstances so understanding the dependent origination means understanding what is possible what is not possible so if we are programmed by a certain mind we will act in a certain way if we are programmed by the uh, sensual sphere of perception we will act in a different way if we are programmed by the uh, perception in the subtle forms we will act in a different way and acting mean exercising will we act because we exercise will and in every mind that differentiates the object that pays attention to the object there is will already now when we understand buddhism we don't want to accumulate a negative will we want to accumulate positive will because we un- we believe in cause and effect if we don't believe in cause and effect we will not want to accumulate the positive will the so the positive will is a positive accumulation of the positive will is a positive karma accumulation of the negative will is a negative karma so as long as we are accumulating we are acting now uh, aim of the disciple is to go beyond acting because he understands perfectly clearly that the karma is the cause of rebirth in the past life and it will be the cause of rebirth in the present life and that the variety of this uh, world is based on karma buddhist scriptures teach so what we experience is based on the incredible variety immeasurable variety of karma which programs the beings now you want to be an arahat you want to get out of the program it does not mean you don't do the good acts arahat can do a lot of good acts but without accumulating karma now a bodhisattva wants has a different programming he want to accumulate the good karma to become a buddha fully enlightened buddha so his programming is different according to our programming we are acting so he needs to extend his understanding of the dependent origination also by logic also by studying languages by studying arts architecture 
all this is useful for extending the scope of knowledge and the scope of knowledge is based for the positive action. If we don't have knowledge, we cannot do positive action. We can do positive action only due to knowledge. Now the knowledge of the world can be interesting for the Arahat, that Arahat can turn to the practice of accumulating uh, positive potential for, his, for realizing the full Buddhahood, or it may not be of interest to an Arahat. So, according to Yogacara, there are two types of Arahat. Those who are interesting, interested in accumulating the positive potential, and those who are not interested. Now, there is a wonderful comparison in uh, the uh, Taj Talun, in the Vigya, in the Pragya Paramita Sutra, Pragya Paramita Shastra by Nagarjuna, which says that one who studies Buddhism has only one aim. There is no, there are no two aims in studying Buddhism. And that is liberation from, liberation from what? From suffering. Now, some of us become liberated. They, to be liberated means to reach the other shore. Pian. To reach the other shore, we have to learn swimming, the Buddha said. And the swimming is indeed the samadhi. If we don't have samadhi, we cannot swim, we cannot attain the other shore. Now, some of us who study Buddhism, they jump into the water and like a rabbit. They jump and pedal, pedal, pedal with their short feet. But if they are good swimmers, they can reach the other shore. Why not? But they have to swim very hard. And they're not interesting, interested at all to touch what is in the river bed. They're only interested to get to the other shore. So they only study impermanence, suffering of impermanence, the non-self due to the suffering of impermanence, and the impurity of the body, and turn away from all this complex because they are disenchanted from all this business, from all this structure of suffering. And to do so, they indeed study the reality by studying that you can only pay attention to one object at the same time, and you pay attention to one object at the same time, you will experience if your attention is based inside and is concentrated, you will experience the fact of impermanence. When you have a conditioning of samadhi, even so you experience the suffering of impermanence, you don't suffer because you have samadhi. In samadhi you don't suffer. So the, to be liberated, one has to have samadhi. And if the samadhi is... Uh, continues, you can be liberated. And it will be continuous only if you have equanimity to the six doors of perception. Otherwise it will not be continuous.
as far as the bodhisattva is concerned, he does not mind to experience uh, the uh, uh, more and more subtle forms of suffering because he uses them in order to learn to be able to help beings. So the approach is slightly different. But again, this is a theory. It does not mean that all arahats behave like a rabbit. Not at all. This is a theory to make us understand certain principles. Now there is another approach to getting to a uh, the other shore, the approach of a horse. The horse enters into the riverbed and goes, goes, goes. He cannot, the middle is too deep to touch. So he pedals, pedals, pedals until he can touch again and gets to the other shore. And actually touching is, if we hold to the object of touching, it becomes suffering. If we do not hold to the object of suffering, of uh, touching, it will not become suffering. And all we experience actually is through the fact of touching. If we want to understand Buddhism, this is what is to be contemplated. And how we experience the reality depends on how we touch. And we can touch with a mind open to all objects, or we can touch with a mind concentrated on one object. All is just the way of uh, uh, touching the object. And through touching the object, we, ex we receive the object, we perceive the object. So, finally, realization and knowledge depends on how we touch the object. When we touch the object, we receive the object. When we receive the object, we differentiate the object. So, uh, very important to see very clearly that the way we experience the reality depends on the way we use our attention, we use our differentiation, and we use all that comes when these two are working, the memory and the pictures of the memory. Based on our previous perfumations of the mind by wholesome or unwholesome thought processes, they are stored in our mind. And you would be surprised what a great capacity for storage this mind has. But we only have to develop this capacity. If we don't develop this capacity, we will not see the ability of the mind for storage, for recording. Meditation is a kind of a sensitivity which develops this uh, So now, if we want to practice the path to omniscience, the non-dualistic approach to reality and to the theory of practice that liberates the mind, 
So, uh, we rely on the transcendental wisdom. The transcendental wisdom makes the things inside and outside balanced, equal. The, what is the difference between the enlightened person, the realized person and the non-realized person? This is a subject matter of great confusion of those who study Buddhism just only as uh, theories without uh, theory for practice that liberates the mind. Hmm? What is a person who has uh, realized the uh, highest reality? What has he realized? He has realized the object, if you can call it an object, which allows us to see everything as equal. Having realized that object, it does not mean that he still perceives everything as equal, that he differentiates everything as equal, not at all. But he has a view hmm, of dependent origination being emptiness. And this view is based on the direct experience of the object which is the object of the middle path. In the object of the middle path, the mind is perfectly balanced. So the eight so-called eight causes of the middle path, the eight factors enabling the middle path, they appear together, inseparable. Because they appear together, we can see impermanence as being something, so to say, created, fabricated. If we don't have this experience, we don't see impermanence as being something fabricated. We are actually in the impermanence. Now the difference for the, those who practice in non-dualistic paths, even so they have not directly experienced that object, they contemplate on that object. That is a true reality. That what an arahat has experienced, is a true reality. Whether we like it or not, this is a true reality. The reality of our attachments, of our likings, of our disliking, is not the true reality. It is our dream. He can see this very clearly. Because he sees it very clearly, so he uh, does not leave the correct view. But he still continues in his attachments, he still continues in his likings and dislikings. Without this, it's, it's, uh, it's practically impossible to live in the world. And the one who studies the Bodhisattva path should know it very clearly and see it very clearly. Without our likings and dislikings, we cannot function in a normal daily life. So we have to penetrate them. 
penetrate them, not just from the point of view of suffering, but penetrate them also from the point of view of the depths of non-dualistic reality. In this non-dualistic reality, the defilements are not always only suffering. The defilements can be a blessing if we use them for learning. And if we can experience them in a balanced mind. The balanced mind will never give rise to a powerful defilement. Only a non-balanced mind can give rise to the powerful defilement. This is very important to understand. So the job of the uh, meditator, of anyone who wants to learn the theory for practice that liberates the mind, is to stay in a balanced mind. For that is the practice of the four foundations of mindfulness, the practice of mindfulness. The practice of mindfulness is based on the body. Hmm? When we draw the attention inside the body, the mind will be, can practice, we can practice a balanced mind. If we don't draw the mind inside the body, we are practicing the monkey mind. to draw the mind inside the body, that is the job of the mindfulness. We cannot be mindful really un until we have drawn the mind into the body. Because we will be completely governed by the outer object and liking and disliking to the outer object, but we will not be even aware of it. Now the mindfulness brings awareness, and awareness is wisdom. Now, what is the practice of uh, the disciple who wants to get quickly, quickly over this uh, uh, great river of suffering? to contemplate on the impurities of the body. This is very important practice. Neglected in many traditions of Buddhism, but it is a very important practice. But we have to practice it with understanding. So we can have the understanding either as turning away from the body, getting disgusted with the body, but with the wisdom. What wisdom? The ugly bodies, the dead bodies blown up with pus and so on, they can become the indeed object of disgust, but they can also become the object of the balanced mind if we observe them with the samadhi. So the impure can turn into the pure. Now what is the conclusion of the non-dualistic approach to the practice? Actually the body you cannot reach. <laughs> You can only reach the image of the body. <coughs> However, you observe the body as the whole, as the parts, as the atoms. These are only images. And these images can be further broken, no problem. What can be broken cannot exist 
in itself so ultimately the body cannot be reached however you search for uh, something stable in the body that can be reached you will not find it so you can observe the body as the object of disenchantment which is very important but this disenchantment also depends on the image of the body we make and the image of the body we make depends on the mind which makes the image and according to the mind which makes the image of the body we will have the pleasant or unpleasant or neither pleasant nor unpleasant uh, sensation so the body is uh, neither really a horror nor an object of clinging the body is a fact it is a fact and in ultimate reality the body cannot be reached this is the approach of transcendental wisdom when the body cannot be reached this sensation which is the reception of the body also cannot be reached when the sensation which is the reception of the body cannot be reached the mind which differentiates the body on the base of the sensations cannot be reached also what we reach is our differentiation but not the reality and ultimately because the mind cannot be reached the objects of differentiations also cannot be reached when we understand that we understand how to extend hmm, the scope of the understanding of dependent origination into infinity not only by coining the niyama the rules of mind of karma and so on but by paying attention to the base for these rules which is the mind only all the rules are actually coined in the mind in what mind in the mind which is changing all the time the differentiating mind is changing all the time but is this differentiating mind the uh, the real mind that is a question is it the only thing we can experience that is a question so uh, one has to ask this question contemplate these questions go deep into this question see very clearly the implications of this question here is the depths of the meditation and to ask this question we have to have a certain qualifications and these qualifications we get by the practice of the four foundations of mindfulness 
in the Theravada way or the Sarvastivada way or the Yogacara way based on the transcendental wisdom that ultimately there is no object which we can reach inside, outside, no objects we can reach what we reach is actually our picture of the object based on our memory now to practice yoga chara means to combine this transcendental knowledge which goes beyond the pictures with the correct analysis of the pictures, which is our worldly reality. By understanding that these pictures have the base, this base cannot go over the five aggregates, over the twelve bases, over the eighteen elements, over the dependent origination, over the twenty-two faculties, over the Four Noble Truths. But that this uh, base is based in suchness itself, which can equalize the wholesome, the unwholesome, neither wholesome nor unwholesome, pleasant, unpleasant, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. This suchness is to be studied together with the pictures. So we have the realization based on the transcendental wisdom and we have the realization based on the pictures which comes actually after the realization based on the transcendental wisdom. This explanation of the reality will enable you perfectly to combine the worldly experience with the experience of the One. Finally, the Buddha has taught the truth is One. And all great religions finally teach the same thing. The truth is only One. But the ways to realizing the truth they are the, can be very, very different. But the truth is only one. Why this truth is only one? Because there has to be something if there is a causes and effect it has, there has to be something which is the base for the causes and effects be it God or be it mind you can make it God you can make it mind but to believe in something there as being the rule then you have to have a base for the truth. You have to find a base somewhere which makes this rule stand. Otherwise the rule is there but it has no place to stand except our ideas about what is right and what is wrong. But when you study our history these ideas are always changing and mostly completely wrong.
what our ancestors believed to be reality now seems to be a completely distorted way of reality. So we cannot rely on the worldly intellect only, but the worldly intellect is very useful. We need it. But according to Buddhism, the worldly intellect can correctly assess the reality after the realization of the transcendental wisdom, which makes this reality balance, equal. So this is called the wisdom after the realization. This wisdom after the realization works on the pictures and put them correctly together on the base of the transcendental wisdom, on the base of the knowledge free from differentiation. And that knowledge is the that which has as object the middle path. It is the only the middle path which enables us to find things together as equal. If we don't have the middle path, we will not never put things together as equal. And when we don't put together the things as equal, we will not be able to resolve the conflicts in the world. And the world is endless conflict economical conflict, social conflict. And these conflicts happen because of the wrong attitudes. And our history is a history of wrong attitudes, which have, have caused suffering to billions and trillions of, of beings and billions of trillions of trillions if you believe that this continuity is part of the mind. So uh, we come to the uh, slowly to the end hmm, of these three days, right? Hmm? Do we still have time? So we need uh, to answer the questions. There are quite few questions. Okay. In many suttas, the method of attaining superpowers is not given. Are methods in Abhidhammas reliable? Uh, actually, uh, the methods in Abhidhamma are indeed reliable, but they are, of course, limited. This is very important to see. That's why it is so important to see uh, study Buddhism with a non-dualistic perspective. Whatever you define can only be limited. It's by its very nature, the defining is the uh, limiting the potential of the mind. When you define something, you define it as opposed to something else. So 
So this is the importance of the non-dualistic approach. When you define something, uh, you impose the self-existent nature. When you impose into your differentiating mind the self-existent uh, nature, then your, uh, whether you like it or not, your differentiations will not be objective. Now, the alaya precisely explains that our experience in the world is not objective. It is subjective. It is based on our history. However intelligent we uh, may be, our understanding of history is very, very limited. And we can only differentiate that what we remember. What we don't remember, we can't differentiate. This is the most important thing to see very clearly. Of course, supernatural powers are there. They are not the aim of the yoga, they are the byproduct of the yoga. No matter whether Buddhist yoga, Hindu yoga, but they are very important, especially for the Bodhisattva practice, because the Buddha himself, he realized what he has realized uh, due to his supernatural powers. The supernatural powers are very important, but not the aim. So uh, you will find the practice of supernatural powers described in a slightly different way in the Yogacara, Bhumi Shastra, in a di slightly different way in the uh, Abhidharma, uh, in the uh, Visuddhimagga, which is, has a very, very uh, thorough description of these supernatural powers. Uh, according to the tradition, the descriptions may be slightly different, but the meaning finally is the same. They are the powers based on uh, samadhi and based on the certain use of samadhi. In uh, dhyana, when we enter the dhyana, our mind, so to say, uh, becomes united with the object of our differentiation. But when we have supernatural powers, what is the advantage of the supernatural powers? We, the mind has the power of the dhyana, and Buddha has explained the mind has to has a have a power of the dhyana to be able to swim. He compared the practice of dhyana to swimming. In order to get to the other shore, we have to know how to swim. And the practice of swimming he compared to dhyana. However we explain it, it is always dhyana. We explain it as a Zen, we explain it as the four dhyanas in the subtle forms, the four dhyanas in the uh, formless. But if you study Buddhism without the dhyana, you cannot go to the other shore, impossible. Be it the dhyana based on the transcendental wisdom, or the traditional way of dhyana. Why? Because the dhyana contemplate the object not based on words. What means dhyana? Upani dhyana. Thinking about the object from near and emphatically. Now, when we speak of contemplation, we usually mean in the Western civilization, it means thinking in terms of the words. But in dhyana, you are connected with the object, which is thinking, but you don't need to use any words. The words drop out. 
So you are intensively experiencing the object. Now, if you are in dhyana, your mind is attached to the object of your observation. And uh, unless you go out of the dhyana, strictly speaking, according to the Theravada Abhidhamma, you cannot change the, the object. Because your mind has been united with that, ob that picture. So you may have even the meditators like us who are not the perfect, the Buddha sitting in dhyana, he could not hear, so we are said even the noise of the storm which toppled the trees next to him, he could not hear anything, this is beyond our ability. But uh, dhyana does not mean only that, dhyana means also even you have some sensations, even you have some slight tendency to thinking, you don't lose your object. So you can experience it intensively without interruption. Because you never leave the object. That is the meaning of upa nidyan. Upa means near, Ni means emphatically so. Now, if you have supernatural powers, you can leave the object, but you don't leave the power of the dhyana. So you can go from one object into another, and with the power which the Dhyana in those to the mind. The training in dhyana is a training in the power of the mind. With that power, you can investigate. And this is precisely what the Buddha did. And uh, you can explain it in a slightly different way, but the meaning is always the same. Is the mind at pure land state still not the ultimate state? Thanks. <laughs> this is a misunderstanding. Hmm? And there is a lot of misunderstanding, unfortunately, about the pure land practice, which is the most popular practice in uh, uh, Chinese Buddhism. Hmm? If you have a desire you will be born in the, uh, the world is, in Buddhism, the three spheres of the world. And these spheres of the world is the structure of our mind. If you have desire, you are in the sphere of the world where perception is defined by desire. If you are in the sphere of the subtle forms, you are in the sphere where perception is defined by the subtle form. If you are in the sphere of the formless objects, you are in the sphere where perception is defined by the uh, formless. So these are the uh, three spheres of perceptions defining how our mind differentiates the object. If our mind differentiates the object on the base of desire, you can only be reborn in the sphere defined by desires. It is not possible to be born anywhere else. If you study Buddhism and you believe you will be born somewhere else, it is naive. So, uh, but to be born in the uh, sphere of desire 
where your perception is connected with a pure object and with the contemplation of the infinite compassion of the Buddha hmm? living in that land. Hmm? Then it may help, of course. Then you may be born in the uh, state of uh, purity, but if there is desire, it will be only in the sphere of the uh, desire. Now, uh, what is the secret of the uh, pure land practice? The secret of the pure land practice is that uh, even so you refer to it by desire, hmm? you refer to it by the vows of the Buddha. who has, due to his uh, vows, he has created this land. Hmm? Every bodhisattva, every Buddha has uh, vows. So you rely on these vows of the Buddha to help you hmm? to attain the ultimate reality which is symbolized, but which is, does not mean it is just a picture in the mind, nothing else. You make this picture in the mind, it is a skillful means. And it is skillful means and that's all. Buddha can only teach skillful means. He can never teach the ultimate reality. Ultimate reality cannot be defined. It's impossible. But it can be symbolized. Now, if you have desire for that ultimate reality, it is a wholesome desire, then you will, due to this desire, you will be born in the uh, wholesome existence. In that wholesome existence, hmm? due to the power of the vows of the Buddha, you can realize the ultimate reality, which is beyond desire. The ult in ultimate reality, there cannot be desire. You cannot have the uh, dark side of the moon and the bright side of the moon together. It is impossible. In every desire, there is a dark side. But by understanding that the dark side and the bright side are inseparable, you practice a non-dualistic approach. The pure land is a non-dualistic approach. So, actually the desire is the ignorance. But the ignorance, knowing ignorance as ignorance, is inseparable from the process of liberation. This is a non-dualistic approach. In a non-dualistic approach, the defilements can be body. The body can be defilement. If you understand defilements, you understand the body. But if you understand defilements from the non-dualistic aspect, the dark and the light come together. Where is the other question? Here. Please compare Bardo and Alaya consciousness. Thank you. Well, the uh, Bardo is the speciality of the Northern Buddhism. In Theravada, they don't speak of any Bardo, Antara Bhava. 
The bardo is a state when the alaya consciousness has left the body but has not been yet hmm, uh, in, incarnated into a different body. That state is called bardo, antarabhava. Hmm? And in the Theravada Buddhism, that state is called the uh, state of the hungry ghost, hmm? preta state. So uh, there is a state where the mind is there, but the object of the mind is like a dream, hmm? the pic. This is bardo, because the mind has not yet been incarnated. So what you experience in the dream is uh, like similar to that what you experience in the bardo. Hmm? There is no any outer object, but the mind still works on the base of its attractions and its likings and dislikings. Hmm? And this bardo states and decides how we will be incarnated. Hmm? It's very simple. The world is now full of key opinion leaders, as if to lead is to have an opinion. The more differentiated or extreme, the better. How should we mindfully reside in this world of views and opinion? Now, of course, it's very simple. Don't make it so difficult. By practicing mindfulness, all the unbalanced state of mind, they are due to the lack of mindfulness and awareness. Now, uh, the job of the leaders is not to practice mindfulness and awareness. The job of the leaders is to uh, uh, put their opinion through. Hmm? And they are doing very well through the uh, uh, public opinion which they control. Hmm? And uh, so we beings, uh, we are being brainwashed. Brainwashed in socialism, brainwashed in capitalism, brainwashed in all other, but we are brainwashed. But we don't know we are brainwashed. In order to know that we are brainwashed, we have to practice mindfulness and awareness. And when you know you are brainwashed, you will not be violent. Because you know, you don't know you are brainwashed, you will become violent. And this is what is happening in today's world. This is a tragedy of the today's world. We are being brainwashed, but we don't know that we are brainwashed because we don't have mindfulness and awareness. If a person chooses the Bodhisattva path, how can he make sure and teach the level of being safe from falling down to a normal person? Again, the same thing always turns around the same thing. The mindfulness and awareness. Hmm? If you have mindfulness and awareness, you will not fall into the uh, uh, normal person. If you don't have mindfulness and awareness, for sure you will uh, form uh, a normal person. What is normal person? Normal person is his behavior is dictated by his uh, likings and dislikings only, by his grasping and resistance only, without understanding how to use this uh, complex of liking and disliking for his benefit. We are being in samsara, being, be, is being in this complex. We are all in this complex. But the difference between uh, uh, what you call a normal person is that he is not aware how this complex works. And uh, 
what you may call a not normal person, it is not a not normal person, it is a real person, because to be a real person is to be aware. The real person is aware of this complex of liking and disliking, and he uses it for his benefit. That is a wisdom. For his benefit and for the benefit of others. So he can do more for himself and more for others. Because he uses this complex of liking and disliking for his own benefit and he can when he can use it for his own benefit, he can use it for the benefit of others. This is a secret. So he does not blindly identify with his instincts of uh, greed and resistance. But he experience them with mindfulness and awareness. That's how he can use them to improve himself. And only when one has wisdom to improve oneself, one can improve others. You want to improve others and you don't have the wisdom to improve yourself, that's a desperate situation. Is there any way to experience the transcendental wisdom without realization, even for a bit before we get a realization? Well, uh, there is uh, many ways. Important way is also logic. Hmm? Especially in Tibetan Buddhism, they study logic, they study dialectics. So that you have a very clear mind hmm, about all the Buddhist concepts that are useful for liberation. And uh, finally, uh, the Buddhist dialectics is uh, based on the Yogacara understanding of the world. The Impermanence comes actually from mind, and impermanence is everything that gathers our worldly experience. We have to have a very, very clear concept about it. How impermanence gathers everything in our experience, what are the conditionings of the impermanence, how impermanence has to do with the mental process. And what kinds of mental processes are there? The mental process based on direct experience of the object, mental process based on the inference of the object, mental process based on the scriptures and so on. We have to have a very clear knowledge about all this. What are the conditions of the mental process based on the direct experience? What are the conditions of the valid inference, of the valid direct perception? You have to be very, very clear. Then, when you meditate, you can use this knowledge, this clarity, uh, to your in, in your insight meditation. So the insight meditation becomes uh, very easy. Otherwise, insight meditation means uh, the seeing objects by right differentiation. So you should be very clear about the uh, nature of the uh, valid differentiation. 
and what is the valid differentiation and what is the illusionary differentiation. That should be very clear. What is the valid name and what is the illusionary name. All this should be very clear. What is a valid concept, what is an illusionary concept. Hmm? When you have this clarity, when you go into meditation, you will not go astray. Okay. The Buddha doesn't allow disciples to use supernatural powers. Well, this is not true. Who told you that? Buddha certainly allows his disciples to use supernatural powers and they should be used. The Buddha used them himself. The Buddha realized what he has realized according to the scripture by using the supernatural powers of seeing the previous lives. Hmm? Su Ming, huh? and by using the Tian Yan, the Divine Eye, Divya Chakshu. Hmm? This enabled him to see how we beings are born according to the uh, law of dependent origination and how our previous experiences define our experiences in this life because we are already born with uh, certain tendencies. So the supernatural powers are good and the Yogacara Bhumi Shastra teaches the supernatural powers as a must for a Bodhisattva. The real Bodhisattva must have supernatural power. How can he effectively help the beings unless he can see the, directly their thoughts. So the supernatural, due to supernatural powers, the Bodhisattva gets the, uh, what is called the, uh, uh, the nobility. Hmm? Without the nobility, he cannot be the Bodhisattva. Everybody followed the Buddha because of this power of his nobility. Waili. Huh? And this is also based on the supernatural powers. It's all connected. But the supernatural powers can be misused and they were misused in the time of the Buddha. In the time of the Buddha, at least from reading the literature, this was quite a common thing because the practice of dhyana was part of the, even of the education in the Vedic times. This makes the mind powerful and then the mind can remember many things and it can remain clear until old age. Now, it is not part of the education. This, this part of education is completely neglected. Hmm? So no wonder the society is also in trouble because we only respect accumulating information. We don't respect uh, we don't talk about the importance of powerful mind. It is not part of education. So unless one tries for it by himself, the society will not care. So the next one. How do you practice meditation in daily life? Does meditation help a person awake? Of course. <laughs> You have to practice mindfulness and awareness. Then your daily life will improve. So they are wrong systems of meditation. Some mantra which takes you somewhere high so that you can forget about the troubles of your daily life. This is a wrong system of meditation. This is not the practice which uh, that liberates the mind. This is a practice which make the mind deluded. 
So the Buddhism teaches there is nothing beyond the, uh, what we experience through the five aggregates. There is thinking, but there is no thinker. There is experiencing, but there is not experiencer. There is a feeling, but there is no feeler. When you understand that, you understand Buddhism. And when you understand Buddhism, you have got, uh, uh, as it really is, you have got a theory for practice that liberates the mind. Now the last question. Hmm? What is the relation between the four foundations of mindfulness and the Yogacara approach to mind training? Well, this is a very uh, complex hmm? Now, question, of course there is a relation. Without the Yogacara is the uh, Mahayana tradition which especially emphasizes the practice of mindfulness, the, of the practice of four foundations of mindfulness. Uh, some traditions uh, kind of neglect this practice. But it is not correct. The practice of uh, four, four foundations of mindfulness is the only practice leading to the realization of selflessness. But you can explain it in many different ways. So Yoga Chara explained it with this uh, complex structure of uh, differentiation that you have to bring into your understanding of the four foundations of mindfulness a much more wider understanding of the uh, basis for dependent origination and of the causes. Not just twelve causes, twelve nidanas, in Theravada you have, beside the 12 causes, the 24 uh, conditionings. Hmm? But the 24 conditionings, they are based on the analysis of the mind, on the pattern of the Theravada investigation. That you can only make one object in the mind at the time. And that the mind works according to the rules which you are being taught, and you actually see that it works according to the rules. But you have kind of defined these rules in your mind also. This is uh, what is difficult to understand. So these rules are very valid, but they are not the uh, absolute reality. They are the means to realize the absolute reality. So, in uh, Yogacara, in order to understand the depths of Yogacara, you have to realize established four truths which are considered to be the suchness, hmm? namely the suchness of suffering, Suchness of the cause of suffering, which is the suchness of suffering, is called the anliti, huh? the truth that you establish. If you don't establish the truth of suffering, you have not established any practice, because we practice because we have suffering. If you don't understand that you have suffering, you will never practice. So that's why it is called established truth. If you don't have established truths, you will not practice in any way. So first, you have to establish the truth of suffering because you have experienced suffering. You have the faith that there is something beyond suffering. Now this truth of the cause of suffering is also suchness. And this suchness is in Yogacara. It is called the suchness of the wrong conduct. Hmm? 
because our conduct is wrong, we are suffering. Now, uh, the opposite of that is the right conduct, which is the cause of the end of suffering. And the right conduct is according, should be according to the suchness. In attuned to suchness. And the suchness is non-established truth. The body cannot be established. The sensation cannot be established. The mind which differentiates the sensation cannot be established. And the objects of the mind that differentiates also cannot be established. The impermanence cannot be established because you establish impermanence when you pay attention, concentrated attention, to one object at the time and differentiate this object as being different from the other object. So, in a way, uh, directly or indirectly, you have imposed the self-existent nature on the, the, on the object. And self-existent nature is an error because of seeing self-existent nature we do not see the fact of uh, the suchness of the mind. And because we don't see the suchness of the mind we don't see the uh, composed nature of that which is the object of the differentiated mind and which is the subject of the differentiated mind. The differentiation itself, the fabrication itself. So you get a different understanding based on non-dual approach. The duality arises in the mind itself. But to differentiate the object is not a mistake. It is not a mistake, but it is a limitation. And the Bodhisattva in the Yogacara understanding is the one who is fully aware of this limitation. And because he understands sorrow is his limitation, he can get a deep intuition into reality being just one. So he wants to realize not only the, the reality of uh, which is super mundane, chusha, he wants to realize the super mundane reality in this world, in this world of images, which uh, rule the, uh, our differentiation. So that much for today. Hmm? Let us transfer Mary for the benefit of all sentient beings. Okay.